Well, hello. Uh, my name's Adrian Gilbert, and uh, today I want to talk to you about something which is a bit of a puzzle, a puzzle to me anyway, a puzzle in our own times. Now, as you probably know, I write a lot of books about ancient mysteries, and I'm always on the lookout for new ways of seeing the world, of trying to understand uh, our ancient past, but also modern day science, new perspectives on that, especially the electric universe paradigm. But today I want to talk to you about uh, my own little mystery, um, which concerns this. Now, I don't know how well you can see that from there, but this is actually an iron meteorite. And it was sent to me this last year for my birthday. It's a birthday present my 70th birthday. Now, I don't know who sent it to me. <laughs> That's the biggest mystery of all. But the question is, why did they send it? Um, what was their reason and motivation? Now, I just want to give you a, a few facts about this, right? It's an iron meteorite. Meteorites come mainly in two categories. There are iron ones and there are kind of rocky ones. And the iron ones are much rarer. There are only about 10%, I'm told, of meteorites which are made of iron. And they're the more valuable ones. And to put this in some perspective, uh, this is the, the person who sent this is unknown to me. I don't know who they are. I've asked around my friends. I've asked around people. I thought it could be involved somehow, but no, none of them. So I have to ask myself, well, who sent this and why? And the reason I ask that is that going on eBay and checking about iron meteorites, I discovered that typically an iron meteorite, the, the, the value of it is, is charged by the weight. And the weight, certainly in eBay terms of what's available there, uh, they charge a pound per gram. So typically, if you were buying a 30 gram meteorite made of iron, it would cost you 30 pounds. Quite a lot of money, isn't it? Um, this meteorite weighs just under a kilogram. It's around 981 grams. So we're talking about a, a gift of a meteorite which in eBay terms, and I don't know how well that applies, would be worth probably around a thousand pounds, at least. I'm thinking that probably a large meteorite like this, this is relatively large. As you can see, it fits in my hand. Actually, it fits perfectly in my hand. It's almost like it's made to measure. Um, we're talking about something which is at least a thousand pounds, probably a lot more than that. So why would someone send a meteorite to me worth a thousand pounds or more uh, as a birthday present for my 70th birthday. Well, it came with a letter. And I'm, I'm not going to read this to you, but it came with a letter uh, explaining how it was a birthday gift to me. And what was very apparent from this letter was that the person sending it knew quite a lot about my work. Uh, especially they knew about my, my last book, The Blood of Avalon. And what I'd been talking in there about the Rose of Britain, the, the uh, idea that the, you've heard of the Walls of the Roses, the White Rose and the Red Rose, White Rose of York, Red Rose of Lancaster. And I talked about that. But really the rose, the, vin, the vine on which the roses grow symbolizes the royal family of Britain. So you had different sports and branches. Now I can imagine when they were picking the roses in Shakespeare, this is in the Temple Garden, they're picking the roses, the white and the red rose. They may well have been growing on the same bush because what you would do is you take a briar rose stock plant that in the ground and then you graft onto the rose your hybrid that you want to 
produce your actual roses for cutting. We still do that today, yeah? Um, when you buy a rose, you go into the nursery or the garden center, you'll find that your rose that you're buying, your species rose, is that the right term? Hybrid rose, I think is probably a better term, is grafted onto the stock. And so it's quite possible that if a rose is not pruned and is allowed to throw out uh, what are called suckers from the main root stock, these suckers will be of the original briar rose and the the cultivated rose, the one that you're growing, will also be producing roses. You could have this, you could have two different roses, one a wild rose off the the root stock, and the other a cultivated rose, and that's exactly what's really being talked about in the Wars of the Roses. And yeah, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the red rose of Lancaster symbolizes the grafting onto the Rose of Britain, the Briar Rose of Britain, the house uh, of from William the Conqueror, the, the, the French Rose, the Rose of Gallica, the Red Rose, the Rose of Gaul. That's what that's about. And the White Rose is the, the Wild Rose of the Field, the Briar Rose of York, is actually connected with the family of the Mortimers who had married into the old Welsh stock of the Prince Llewellyn, the last Prince of Wales. So there is this thing going on there, this secret teaching about roses and the lineages of Britain and who really deserves to be ruling and for what reason. But I also put in there the story of the Rosicrucians, who are the people uh, who started a movement in the 17th century. I'm not talking about the uh, society in California that sends out mail order um, things, uh, they, they advertise mail order courses in self-development. I'm not talking about that at all. The original Rosicrucians were people who were trying to produce a new civilization and instauration of science. And they were harking back to what's called the golden rose. We have golden roses today. I've got some in my garden. I've got I've got white and red roses too, but I have golden roses, and they symbolise the bloodline of the royal the, the holy family of Jesus Christ. And when you go into the uh, the the old manuscripts of the Welsh, you discover that the are genealogies there which talk about a marriage between a lady called Anna, who was a cousin of the Virgin Mary, and someone called Belly. And when you do, dig a little bit further, you find out that this Belly was actually a royal prince from the house of Trinovantum. I'm not going to go down that path because that's not what I really want to talk about. But what's um, evident about this meteorite and the person who sent it is they know all about this and they know about how I had written at the very end of that book that this bloodline this, these uh, legends and families and traditions and I went into a lot of detail about that uh, there's always the hope that a new uh, golden rose like Jesus is going to appear and it seems to me evident from what they've said that they believe that such a person has been born and there is the potential for a new Messiah. Now, I don't know much more than that about what they believe, but I'm intrigued by this meteorite. And so I've got a few things I want to say here. Um, I've told you about the dimensions of the meteorite. So why was it sent to me and by whom? And why are they being so generous? Iron meteorites are relatively rare, I've said that. Um, where do they come from? Now, meteorites, I mean, I'm sure most people here know all too well that meteors are what we call um, shooting stars in the sky. You just see them flash across. And they're particles, dust-sized particles that come into the atmosphere and they burn up 
and that's why we just see a flash of light and things burnt up. But if a, a, the material that's coming in is larger, then it can come streaking in as a ball of matter and it can come right down to the ground. And very often these meteorites will blow up as they come in. There's, there was one in Russia, I think, fairly recently that the people filmed it. It made such a sonic boom, it broke windows all over the place. Um, this one that I have here is clearly a fragment from a much larger rock, or I should say lump of iron, that must have come in. You can see that there's a smooth surface. I, you probably can't see it that clearly there, but there's a smooth surface on that side, and then it's all lumpy and, and uh, sort of uh, irregular on the other side. And that tells me that when a meteor meteorite comes in it sort of heats up on the outside and it sort of burns off the outer coating and it, it can be really smooth and if they land intact then the whole thing will be smooth but very often they either explode before they reach the ground or else maybe they fragment when they hit the ground and this I think is a fragment of something that was much larger that came down to earth and the people who sent me this, um, or the person, I should say, uh, said that uh, it was a fragment from a, uh, a fall that happened in, I think I've written it down here. But if, I think it's around 1475 BC anyway, um, that there was a big comet that came over um, Britain, uh, not Britain, but came over the world at that time. And some of it must have fallen off. And the people have talked about that. There are books about uh, the Velikovsky. Have you heard of him? Emmanuel Velikovsky. He talked about this big comet from around that period, which he believed was Venus, actually, coming out of Jupiter. Another theory. Um, and that it had as it came close to the earth it caused all sorts of chaos and trouble uh he, he wrote a book called worlds in collision about this uh, it was a very famous book bestseller and that was back in 1948 i think he wrote it 49 and it was a big bestseller at the time and and again later um and other people have written about the idea that there was a, a big ball in the sky this comet, uh, which is the origin, so-called, of the Akhenaten religion of the atom, that the atom disk, and you've seen the atom disk, I'm sure, um, with the sort of fingers coming out from the, the disk and them worshipping it. The time of Akhenaten, the father of Tutankhamun, um, that they started a new religion of the atom disk. And, then, and people have argued that it wasn't the sun that they were worshipping at that time. It was actually this big comet. Well, I don't know about that. I have no idea. But the idea that there was a some kind of cometary impact around that time, or a meteoritic impact, perhaps a fragment from a comet, and that this is a piece of it, again, I have no idea. I don't know how they, they, th they say that or think that. Um, but they obviously want to draw my attention to it. So I have to ask myself, well, wh why have they sent me this? Well, it's an iron meteorite. Where do they come from? Well, they may have come from this comet. But what is that? Where did that come from? Well, when you look at the uh, solar system, there is actually a planetary law or rule that tells us the distance that the different planets should be from the sun. It's known as Bode's law. Um, and there's a sort of uh, an equation you can use to work out exactly where the next one should be. And, and sure enough, the planets fit that rule very, very well. Uh, they do, they are exactly in the right order as they should be in the right places in the orbits. So it's, it's quantized. The orbits of the solar system are quantized. They're not, they're not random certainly for the, the major planets. 
But then we have the minor planet, the, the asteroid belt, which has sort of planetesimals in it. And you wonder about that. But when you apply this Bode's law, it makes it very clear there should be another planet there. And yet there isn't. There's these larger and smaller lumps. Um, the largest one is Ceres. Um, and they're moving around in this region between Mars and Jupiter. And it looks to me, and I know that science doesn't like this idea, but it looks to me like there used to be a planet there, but something happened and it got destroyed. Now, there has been new evidence that supports this idea. First of all, we've discovered that some of these fragments of these, or these lumps of rock, are actually iron. And other ones that have been now explored, they've sent probes to them to get up really close and look. They look more like fragments of a planet or a moon or something, rather than as the, the, the scientific consensus is that they're just the debris left over from the formation of the solar system. The, there was this disk of matter that kind of was going around the sun and it gradually formed these planets and then there was some left over in the middle here and it just didn't form a planet, it just became this stuff. But when you look at the planets in detail, the planetesimals, these asteroids in detail, we discover that they actually have uh, strata just like you would see if you're examining rocky strata on Earth. They don't look like... Uh, a collection of dust that's kind of agglomerated. They look as though they've got weathering patterns on them. So the idea that these are somehow fragments from a planet that was once there, that is no longer, that's been smashed up, uh, I think is quite strong. Arguing against that, they say, well, yeah, there's not enough of it. That the, the, the stuff that's left over is only about you know, 10% of the moon or something in terms of, of mass. Well, I say, so what? <laughs> That's what's left. We don't know what happened to the rest of it, do we? And some of it has obviously come down to Earth. Some of it may have gone to other places. In the solar. Some of it may have gone into the sun. We don't know, do we? But some of it's been left there in the space where we would expect there to be a planet. And I would add also that the largest of these uh, asteroids, that one called Ceres, is pretty much um, a sphere. So I would argue, well, maybe that was a moon of the original planet. Maybe that is not just a fragment, it's the moon that's now settled down into an orbit around the sun. I'll leave that with you, that thought. Now... The asteroid belt, I think, is left over uh, from the form the, the, from the smashed up planet, and uh, the, yes, the fall date that was given to me was 1486 BC, right, which corresponds to the date that Velikovsky claimed Venus as a comet came close to the Earth. Other writers, too, point to this date as significant in terms of a massive comet. So why send me the meteorite in the first place? I think it's to make a point. And that point is connected with the book of Revelation. And I am going to write, or I'm actually going to record, a whole series of lectures on the book of Revelation, which I've studied in detail for a long time now. And... I think I have some of the answers, at least, for what that book is all about. In, in fact, if some of you uh, I know who will be watching this probably came on that trip with me to Egypt and Israel in the year 2000, what I call the opening of the Stargate. And I wrote a book on it. I wonder if I have it here. Yes. I wrote a book called Signs in the Sky, which... Uh, was a prophecy I was making in, I actually wrote this book in uh, year 1998 to 99, and I was talking about how certain configuration in the sky 
in the sky at the time of year 2000 around the summer solstice exactly mirrored the symbolism contained at the very start of the book of Revelation in the first three chapters where it describes this cosmic being, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, standing amid seven candlesticks, which are seven stars. Well, at that time, we actually had the constellation of Orion standing amidst the seven planets of the ancients, which were the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Those were the seven lights or, or stars or planets of the ancients. And that's never happened before in the last 2000 years, that those have all been gathered up like that around Orion. So I produced a lot of other evidence as well to, to back this up. I didn't just write that for the sake of it. But the fourth chapter in the book of Revelation starts, Lo in heaven a gate is opened, a door is open." And that is the Stargate, as I call it, which is where the ecliptic crossed over or crosses over the median plane or the equator, if you want to think of it that way, of the Milky Way. And where that crossroads in heavens is, was well known to the ancients. It's also known to the Mayans, by the way, and the Aztecs. So this was something that people knew in the past, but we have forgotten that there's significance about this point. And the, what the significance this time is that the sun was positioned at that point on the day of the summer solstice. Has been for the last number, of, you know, since about 1948. So where does that leave us? Well, there is a prophecy in the book of Revelation that says here um, that there's going to be another comet or light or something falling to earth and it's actually in chapter 8 um, of the book of Revelation 8.10 it says a third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of water the name of the star is Wormwood and a third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died of that water because it was made bitter. Now, that word wormwood, the, the original Greek, I've got an interlinear uh, English Greek New Testament, and it tells me that, that that word in Greek was absinthos, which is the same as the French word absinthe, uh, which means wormwood. And it's a, wormwood is a very bitter herb, and it was used still is, I think, in some places, uh, as a herbal remedy for intestinal worms. You know, if you've got worms in your gut, <laughs> these days you probably go to the chemist and get some pills for it. <laughs> yeah. I expect you've taken them or given them to children before when they've picked up pinworms. But if you've got intestinal worms and you wanted to get rid of them, you would, you would take wormwood, which is quite a strong poison, actually, and you've got to be careful with that. But it will kill off the intestinal worms and clear you of them. So I would suggest that this falling star, this wormwood, is not just a punishment uh, in symbolic terms in the book of Revelation. It's actually talking about a purgative of some sort. And this connection with rivers, third of the rivers, well, which rivers? It can't fall on every river on earth, can it? But... Two major rivers are the most likely ones, which are themselves connected in, with the book of Daniel. Um, and the book of Daniel is set in Mesopotamia. Mostly, anyway. There's a little bit in Persia as well. But the book of Daniel talks about... Uh, the, the end of that book talks about the end days, and it talks about a sealed book that Daniel's not allowed to know the contents which are sealed until the time of the end. Well, lo and behold, the book of Revelation is all about opening the seals on a book. I put it to you, the same book. I'm going to go into that in detail when I, I work on these lectures that I'm going to put together. But it seems to me that whoever sent this meteorite to me 
is saying, look, it's going to happen very soon. Draw your attention to it. Uh, think about this. Uh, here is a gift. Um, it's not just an insignificant gift. It's, it's a, a major gift because we want you to take notes. And I have done. And now I put out an appeal to you. I'd like you to share this, if you can, with your, your friends, with other people on the net, as much as you can, because I want to know, I want the people who sent this to know that I've received it, because they didn't give me a return address. <laughs> they wanted to be anonymous, and I'm sure they have very good reasons for that, and I respect those reasons. But I would like the message to get back, if possible, that yes, I have received this, I understand what you've written, and I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. So if you could share this and let them know that I'm watching and that I'm going to be getting on doing my work, which is to... You see, when I, when I go into things like the Bible and the book of Revelation, I don't go in like a man with a white collar on. I'm not out to, to sermonize people. I'm not out to uh, start a religion or... Uh, reinforce some particular f sex prejudices. What I want to do is to find the facts. And I'm, when I look at that book, I understand that it's a puzzle book. The whole Bible is a big puzzle book. It's not just a one to, for some other guy wearing fancy clothes and a big hat to come along and say, get on your knees and worship God. I say so and you obey what I say because otherwise you're going to hell. I don't look at it that way. We're probably all going there anyway, if we're not careful. What I look at is, what is it really saying? What is the real underlying esoteric teaching within this book? How does that fit into the mosaic of world cultures and religions? And what is its message for today? Because I can tell you, when I've asked priests in the past about the book of Revelation, they've all said to me, don't worry, Adrian, it's, it's way in the future, long after our time. Don't, don't worry your little heart about that. Well, I don't think so. I think it's now. And we need to know now because it matters to us to know what that book is about, to know about the prophecies in the Bible which lead up to that book, especially the book of Daniel, how that connects with the book of Revelation, and to unlock its secrets because now it's being opened but you can open a book and if someone doesn't read it <laughs> they still don't know its contents do they so if it's being opened up there somehow the opening door the the, the thing being uh, unsealed it's down to us to pick it up and say right what's this all about and to use our wits to try to read it and that's what i try to do so thank you very much this has been a bit longer than i was expecting um but please Share this uh, video if you can. Um, like my channel if you can. It, there's, there's other things on there if you go, go into that uh, on YouTube. And I'll talk to you again in due course. Thank you very much.